We're going to focus on the role that international organizations and regional bodies and European partners play in counterterrorism. And to moderate uh, tonight's discussion, I'm very pleased to have as the moderator my very good friend Susan Glasser. Susan is the uh, Editor-in-Chief of Foreign Policy, the magazine of global politics, economics, and ideas. And I know that there are a number of complimentary copies of Foreign Policy magazine in the back, which I know uh, many of you have seen. Susan is a longtime foreign correspondent and editor for the Washington Post. She was. And she joined Foreign Policy in 2008 and has been spearheading the magazine's ambitious expansion in print and online at foreignpolicy.com. During her tenure, the magazine has won numerous awards for its innovative coverage, including no fewer than three digital national magazine awards, and was recently honored for online excellence by the Overseas Press Club. Susan spent four years as co-chief of the Post's Moscow Bureau and covered the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq for the Post in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 before returning to Washington, where she edited the Post's weekly Outlook section and led its national news coverage. Now I turn to Susan Glasser. Thank you, Susan. Thank you so much, Clark, and thank you so much uh, for hosting all of us. Um, I have to say, I appreciate the audience staying here right before dinner. Uh, you know, we have the tough job. We're competing with the Olympics, too, so thank you very much. Uh, I think it's a particular honor to be able to convene a conversation now that brings in some of the non-American perspectives and to talk uh, with European partners, not only about the European and American cooperation together over this last decade of counterterrorism, uh, but also how international organizations play a role. It's, it's, it's a great topic, and there's so much we can cover uh, in the next hour. So I'm going to jump right into that uh, and not leave too much uh, to the imagination. Let me quickly introduce our very distinguished panel tonight. To my right, we have uh, Gilles de Kershove, uh, who is the counterterrorism coordinator for the European Union uh, and has pretty much been inside all of these stories. To his right, we have Richard Barrett, who is the coordinator at the United Nations for the Al-Qaeda Taliban sanctions monitoring team. He's followed by Ambassador Peter Ammon, who is the German ambassador to the United States, and Karen Betts, on the far right, who is the counselor for foreign and security policy right now at the British Embassy in Washington. She comes to us from having worked on Afghan policy uh, in London, and before that she worked as political counselor in Iraq. So she has a pretty broad range of experiences that bear on this conversation. And in fact, I'm going to go ahead and start with her. Of course, today we've seen the opening ceremony of the Olympics filled with much fanfare. And um, I'll leave it to the audience to decide what they think of our presidential candidate, Mitt Romney's intervention, as they say, in the security question around in the Olympics. But clearly, it's an extraordinary mobilization uh, of security that has occurred uh, in London in order to prepare for the games. And as part of that, uh, we were talking before the panel and the conversation began, uh, there's clearly been an extensive consideration about what exactly is the nature of the threat that uh, is posed not only against the thousands of athletes who have gathered in London uh, for the next few weeks, but uh, more generally, what is the state uh, of the world when it comes to threats to Europe and the European homeland, if you will, right now? And so, Karen, I thought we'd go ahead and start with that part of the conversation. Um, thank you, Susan. And uh, uh, as I think all of you can imagine, the, the Olympics have been a, a huge priority for my government, uh, really in the months and years building up to today's opening ceremony, which I hear has gone well, but uh, I feel like I've been in a bit of a... Uh, a bit of an isolated bubble. I'm not quite sure of the details of, of, of how this evening has gone. It should pretty much be over, I think. Um, but on the basis of that, I wanted to, to give you a bit of an outline of, of how the UK uh, views the, the terrorist threat at the moment, because obviously we've thought about this quite a lot in the run-up to the Olympics, and it came up uh, in some detail, and in particular yesterday, and I think it uh, would be interesting to respond to some of those points. Um, I mean, I think in general, uh, the British government would agree that the threat that al-Qaeda poses to all of us at the moment has diminished. Um, but we would very much say that the threat hasn't gone away. Um, the UK has experienced a credible terrorist attack plot uh, every year uh, since 9-11. It's averaged out to about uh, one a year. 
Um, the latest one was in May uh, this year when a, 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 another AQAP plot was uncovered to, uh, to put a bomb on another aeroplane. Now, the fact that none of those at, uh, attack plots have been successful since 2005 uh, really, really is a tribute to our uh, intelligence and security and, and police services and also to all the work that UK troops have been doing uh, in Afghanistan alongside US troops and the troops of other nations to, to tackle the threat at source. But really what I'm saying is that from our point of view, we've kind of reached a stalemate, a point at which uh, um, uh, a number of terrorist organisations are still trying to attack us, uh, but we've got better at stopping them. Uh, moving on from, uh, from, from the sort of specifics of the threat and getting into uh, what it looks like, uh, I mean, we would say, uh, in agreement, I think, with a lot of others here, that the shape of the threat is now changing significantly. I mean, a couple of years ago, our security services uh, were dealing with terror about 75% of the casework that they were dealing with in terms of threat plots into the UK emanated from the Afghanistan-Pakistan border areas. Now it's less than 50% uh, coming from that area, but the, the terrorist threat really looks like it's, uh, it's broadening. It's much less monolithic than it was, and it's now coming uh, from, from a number of different places. So we're seeing particular threats from AQ affiliates in uh, Yemen, Somalia, uh, across the Sahel, uh, and indeed, you know, we suspect, uh, I think along with many others, that AQ is also operating in, in Syria, Syria now. So, uh, so the threat picture has changed, but it's still very much there. I mean, more broadly, there are a couple of broader points I'd like to, to make uh, in addition to all of that. I mean, our view is that, um, uh, and our experience is, that terrorist problems have a very long tail. Um, so... Uh, it's very rare that, that, that terrorist issues just, uh, just stop. And so we will need uh, to work with the changing nature of the threat uh, persistently, probably over a long period of time into the future, if, if we are really to tackle it. And that will be a combination of, of security pressure and, and searching for political solutions. Mm -hmm. Karen, um, thank you so much. I, I want to get others to jump in right now on sort of the big picture threat assessment, and then we can come back to this uh, persistent question about what to do about it. Uh, Gilles, do you agree? I mean, this has been, in some ways, you could say some of the conversations we've had up until now suggest a sort of America versus Al-Qaeda uh, view of the, the big picture threat. Where, where do you come down on that? I fully agree with the assessment that was just made. Uh, indeed, we agree that AQ has been seriously, uh, the core has been seriously degraded but we are faced with a much more diversified threat coming, I would say, in a nutshell, from three sources uh, in Europe. Or the European homeland, as you said, but uh, or interest abroad. The first are the franchises. And, and yesterday, my first question to uh, Michael Leiter and, 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 and the head of the NCTC, uh, I was struck that he did, did not mention uh, Sahel. Um, one of my uh, worry now, uh, concern, is to see um, three sort of groups um, developing in, in Africa, uh, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, uh, which has been reinforced by the, uh, the fallout of, of the Libyan crisis, uh, with uh, other organizations like Mujao, like Ansar el-Din, um, Boko Haram, we've seen in northern Nigeria, and, and Al-Shabaab, low. We know they have been uh, under heavy pressure uh, uh, in, in, in Somalia, and they turn to Al-Qaeda to recover a bit. Uh, the, the concern I have is, is to see one day these three organizations uh, structuring more their links. We know that some uh, Boko Haram fighters have been trained in uh, Somalia. I've, I've heard a number like, like 200. We know that some Boko Haram have been trained by EQIM, and that explains the change in the modus operandi. They, they now use suicide bombers. Um, for the time being, it's, it's only personal relations. It's not structured, but, but the, the concern would be to see that more structured. Um, I think we have to be cautious in all discourse not to suggest that it's, it is uh, a, a sort of new reorganization of Al-Qaeda. The more we suggest that all the franchises are part of a common goal, the more I think we send the message that the organization is still strong. The best would be, I think, to tackle each uh, problem uh, on, on, on its own, uh, I would say not on merit, but on, in, on its own problem, uh, regional problem. 
the, 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 the second source of, of concern is, uh, I would say, jihadists coming from Europe, uh, going to the hotspot. Uh, for for uh, a long period of time, it was uh, mainly Afpak. Uh, and it's more and more Somalia and, and Yemen. And, and, and one of the concerns would be to see uh, northern Mali to become uh, attractive for fighters. And, and the last one, of course, is, is homegrown. It's not that big, but we've had several cases in Europe in recent years uh, where someone, uh, people not connected at, at all with Al-Qaeda core or with the franchises, uh, probably most of the time radicalized on the Internet, decide to uh, fall into violence. We've had the case, uh, of course, not linked to Al-Qaeda, uh, linked to extreme right, uh, just one year ago with Breivik in, in, in Norway. We've had a, a, a case in, in Denmark, a case in Sweden, and so forth. And, 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 and in a way, uh, it's not uh, a, a lot, but what is worrying for the future is a bit the sort of mimetism where someone who is disenfranchised uh, uh, can get access on the internet to how to build a bomb or can easily access to weapons uh, and, and just express his disappointment, his disenfranchised in, in, in violence. So it's a bit this, this four set of, of, of concern. Mm -hmm. Richard, do you agree with your colleagues that uh, essentially, as, as Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta said not too long ago, that Al Qaeda is, it, if not defeated, on the brink of strategic defeat? Is that your assessment as well? Yes, I, I do tend to that view. Uh, Al Qaeda is certainly incredibly much weaker than, than it was, um, you know, even six years ago, I would say. And that's the consequence, obviously, of, of a lot of the activity that's been going on around the world to try to defeat it. And, of course, the challenge now is, uh, as was said on an earlier pattern, panel about Saddam Hussein, it's not necessarily how to get rid of a dictator, but how did he get there in the first place to, to, be, to be a dictator. Same with terrorism is... I think we have to consider not so much how we defeat the terrorists as, as why they are terrorists in the first place. You know, what are, what are the things that have driven them towards that? And of course, we've always had terrorism. Terrorism has been part of history since the earliest times. And unfortunately, I guess we, we always will. So we have to manage it to a certain extent. We can't, I think, hope to eliminate it completely. And the Al-Qaeda phenomenon has been extraordinary. And if you see terrorism as a form of communication, which I, uh, I guess is often said, then Al-Qaeda's spectacular attacks have been an incredibly effective form of communication and inevitably, of course, picked up by the media and um, achieving that fundamental aim of terrorism, which is to make people scared. I don't think terrorists set out to kill us all, but they, they want to make us fearful that they may kill us. And uh, it's that raising of public anxiety which, of course, gives terrorism its opportunity to get uh, public pressure on government policies so that they are changed in the way that the terrorist group would, would welcome. So, uh, uh, of course, as, as has been said, you know, there's a lot of terrorism around, there's lots of things to be worried about, but, I mean, on Gilles' point of uh, al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb, the Boko Haram <coughs> and, and al-Shabaab linking up, I mean, clearly there are, as you say, clear signs of cooperation, but... If we consider hearing about the um, interagency difficulties of cooperation within the United States, as we've heard about uh, this year and previous years, you can think about the um, inter-terrorist group difficulties of cooperation that exist between Somalis, <laughs> um, Algerians, and Nigerians. So, you know, I think we just, you know, we don't want to exaggerate it. We, we always right. have to keep it in proportion. Well, I certainly, I want to, Ambassador Irwin, I want to get your perspective on this and also perhaps throw out the next question to the group and get your, you to start us off here. A country that has not been mentioned almost at all uh, so far, which certainly bears uh, discussing in this context, is Iran, of course. And uh, there are uh, early reports not yet verified about whether there was possible uh, Iran or Hezbollah involvement in the attack last week in Bulgaria uh, against the Israeli tourists. Uh, but more broadly, uh, you know, certainly the nature of the threat posed inside Europe or beyond its borders uh, by Hezbollah is, is somewhat different than that posed by uh, al-Qaeda franchise groups in the Sahel. So I'm curious, um, Ambassador Emma, to get your get us going on that. Yeah, th thank you, Susan. I think many American friends I spoke to said that, uh, or described the situation as a fight between uh, America on one side and Al-Qaeda on the other side without any idea why Al-Qaeda was fighting America, but it, has, it was a fight which had to, to, to be won. And I think we have to look beyond that. It's not a fight between 
uh, America and Al Qaeda. It's a fight between the West and uh, some terrorist groups, uh, and we have to understand what makes them tick, what, what, why they are uh, attacking us. And just for to, to, to round up the, 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 the picture, we had uh, some serious cases in Germany, which had the potential to be as uh, uh, terrible uh, events as the ones in Spain. You remember the. the the, the, the train, the, the train uh, attacks uh, in Madrid, and uh, in, in the bus bombing and tube bombing in London. So, uh, on this, uh, this gives me an occasion to thank the Americans who had helped us to uh, to, to crush these uh, attempts because it was with their co cooperation that we could infiltrate in the groups and really uh, follow their. Uh, bad doings up to, to the very end, so we prevented uh, a major catastrophe in Germany, and not only one, but, but quite many. So there is a threat, and we live with this threat, but we have to understand that threat, and uh, I, I would say there is uh, something uh, which we really have to look into much, more, much deeper. We, of course, have to, we have streamlined our internal organization. There's always... Uh, uh, you ha always have to bring organizations together, uh, various agencies, to be effective. But this will not solve the problem forever. It will help us to diminish the risks, and we, we must do it, and we have done it, but we have to address the underlying uh, problem, and I think this uh, merits a much deeper debate. So, quickly, uh, do you have anything to add on uh, Iran, or should we go to the other members of the group, and what kind of a threat uh, terrorism from their sponsorship of it poses to, to Europe today? Well, I think it was Jill who said that uh, this is an old, terror is an old phenomenon, and it is uh, an instrument. Usually it's an instrument for the underdog against the, uh, the top dog. Uh, if, you, if you have no mili military uh, means at your hands, which could bring you in a, in, 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 in a uh, balanced uh, position, you will uh, go to terror, become, you will uh, use means of terror. And of course, we have a number of conflicts, and we have a conflict with Iran uh, for quite different reasons. Uh, and I'm worried that this also might, in the end, uh, spawn terror. Jill, your membership of the European Union is divided uh, in some ways on this question about whether to engage with Hezbollah or not. Yeah, indeed. Uh, um, in in Beirut, uh, half of the member states would engage with Hezbollah, the other half not. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a political assessment, and, and I'm often asked the question where, why is it that Hezbollah, and especially from the American friends, is not on a terrorist list? My answer is that not all the terrorist organizations are on the terrorist list, and, and <laughs> so you can draw the conclusion you want. But, but because the Hezbollah is in the government, plays an important role, and, and what we need to do is to uh, convince Hezbollah and the Sunni group as well to, to build a democratic and, and, um, state in Lebanon and respectful of, of all the ethnic groups and all the uh, religion and all the, the citizens. Uh, as to the, the attack in Bulgaria, the investigation is not over, so it's impossible to state at this stage that it's the Hezbollah or another group. Uh, yeah. it's not Although a, both the it's Israelis not, it's and It's not the impossible, but it, it's much too early to, to draw any conclusion. Mm -hmm. So even though the Israelis and uh, U.S. government officials have been quoted as saying so, you're reserving judgment. I was at, at a meeting with the 27 Minister of Interior three days ago, and, mm -hmm. and the Minister of uh, Interior of, of Bulgaria was extremely cautious not, not to draw any conclusion at this stage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Some of our American officials at this conference have been uh, understandably uh, cautious in discussing the American policy toward drones. I'm wondering uh, whether this group can talk from uh, the other side of the Atlantic uh, as to the Obama administration's counterterrorism policy and where uh, there's a convergence with the European view of whether uh, this new age of uh, attacks from the sky and uh, kill lists by our president uh, is, is, is an approach that you're comfortable mm -hmm. with. And I'm just, I'm just curious in general to get all of the members of the panel to, to help us understand. Sure. I just want to start by saying that be, beside the bilateral relationship, as Peter said, which is uh, really intense and many cases in Europe have been uh, prevented thanks to uh, intelligence provided by, by uh, the Americans, um, at the level of the EU-US relationship, we have uh, achieved a, a very significant progress uh, since 9-11. Mm -hmm. I remember the last speech of Tom Rich, 
uh, uh, delivered in Brussels when he said, had I known uh, earlier that the EU has a role, I would have engaged much more. Uh, since then, uh, Michael Shertoff, uh, Janet Napolitano, Eric Holder, uh, Jane Lute, they come to Brussels very regularly. Mm -hmm. I've myself been to at least two lunch with the 27 ministers and Jane Lute to discuss the consequence of the attack in the south of France, Mohamed Meha, or other cases. So we have achieved a lot of, of interesting projects with DHS. Uh, one of the most contentious recent one was uh, exchange of passenger name record uh, with the uh, DOJ, uh, mm -hmm. MLA, extradition agreements, uh, cooperation between the FBI and Europol, uh, with the State Department. And, and just recently I was in Yemen and I was pleased to see that we have divided the work and we've agreed that you, the Americans, would take uh, the uh, military side of the security sector reform, and we would do the civilian side. Uh, we, we do that in many countries in the world. We support the GCTF, it was mentioned yesterday. And, and finally, the Treasury, another quite contentious uh, program was approved recently, which is called TFTP, Terrorist Financing Tracking Program, which is quite, quite demanding because it asks us, Europeans, to provide our American friends with bulk data linked to payments. So it was a difficult negotiation in the European Parliament. So the, the, the level of cooperation is, is really outstanding. We may uh, have two uh, footnotes. The first one is on privacy. The other, the other one is on the legal approach to the fight against terrorism. On privacy, we have some, not some tension, but sometimes some, some different approach. In Europe, privacy is seen as a fundamental right. So the starting point is that the, the state should not collect data at all. And so if the state wants to uh, collect data, he has to explain why, for how long, for what purpose. And so we're, we're probably a bit more uh, demanding on that side. And we're, we have just started negotiating a sort of uh, umbrella agreement between both sides of the, the Atlantic as a precondition for sharing more information. So privacy is one uh, debate. The other one is the legal approach. We were very pleased by the uh, decision of President Obama to, to shift the paradigm and move from the global war on terror to, to a normal law enforcement criminal justice approach to the fight against terrorism. And that's why we uh, try to define a framework to receive uh, Gitmo detainees. And, and I think we have taken 2,000 detainees, which is not that bad. Uh, Americans have not taken a single one. It was a difficult decision. Um, but, but unfortunately, we've seen the president a bit stuck by Congress on, on, in, in many respects, could not close Guantanamo. Uh, he has not been able to define a long-term policy for detention, as, well, as we have heard this during these uh, two days. Uh, he has uh, um, a problem uh, with uh, the trial of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, another author of 9-11, while Eric Holder said that he would be in New York, it ended up in, in a military commission. Um, and, and more worrying is the recent development in Congress, I would say, the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act 2012, makes it compulsory to detain a, a foreign terrorist suspect uh, arrested in the US, which is, which is a bit odd. And, and even more, the NDAA uh, 2013, uh, an amendment was adopted by two-thirds of the Congress which uh, prohibits any trial of foreign terrorist suspect in the, in the US. So I think we have to have this conversation. We, we, we have it with uh, Aholko, uh, the legal advisor of the State Department, as well as for drones. Uh, I don't want to touch upon the question whether it's a factor for radicalization. We've heard what Sherry Remond said. Mm -hmm. To be honest, I was in Yemen, as I said, I have not heard, and I raised the question several times, uh, many criticism, unlike what I've read so far in, in the New York Times, in many other newspapers. Uh, but on the legal side, and I heard someone saying that yesterday, I think, uh, I have no doubt that the decision to, to strike from a drone is taken after a very careful procedure uh, and a very serious one. I have no doubt. It's, 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 it's a democracy, a very dem dem democracy, and many people e intervene in the process. My only point is we need to, to make sure that we use the, the proper international legal framework. Do we agree with the, uh, what John Brennan uh, explained, the unwilling, unable uh, test for using drones? Because one day the Chinese and the Russians will do that. And if we don't set it right, no, uh, we may have other states which don't have the same uh, 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 very uh, serious procedure uh, doing the same, and we will not be in a position to uh, make any comment. Yeah.
These are uh, pretty big questions. That Ambassador Ammon, did you want to join in on that? Well, I think we have to know who we are. We the West. What, what makes us the West? And these are certain values which we share. And if we uh, give up uh, on them or if we allow any doubts on them, then, of course, we give our adversaries an argument which will enable them to, to, to win fighters for, for, for the next round. So um, we have to make sure that we, we remain what we are. Of course, this is sometimes a difficult balance to find because security measures need some certain infringements on, on, on privacy and, 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 and human uh, and, and liberties. But we, have, we, we shall never give up seeking this fine line, this fine balance, because otherwise we have lost the war before we started it. And uh, I can give you just one example. Uh, the narrative of, of Al-Qaeda was that the authoritarian regimes in the Arab world were su supported by, by the West, who, who spoke of democracy, but never really was serious about it. Now, when uh, democracy came about in in Egypt, for example, and people were asked to vote. Uh, we said, we support it. We, the West said, we support this, despite our fears that maybe in the end the wrong people will, get, will, will be elected. But uh, we said, we, we must run this risk because it's our deep belief that in the end the people's will must prevail. So, and, and, and again, this is a very hard process. It's not an easy answer, but we have to, to, to continue uh, trying to find this fine balance. And with the drones, I must say, uh, the drones are an, a new technology. Uh, I'm fairly sure it will, it will spread. Everybody is scrambling for drones, uh, for, for drones now. Uh, so um, we will ha see this. Uh, in the end, it will be nothing more spectacular than, than a gun or, or a tank or any other weapon that can kill people. The question is, who controls this? How do we control it? What are the rules? And here again, I think our uh, our principles must prevail. Karen, I want to bring you. Oh, sorry, uh, Richard, if you have a. I quick just, I mean, on drones, uh, you know, I mean, it, it's a matter for the US government and for the countries that, uh, that drone strikes happen in. But what I would say is that drone strikes take place against the backdrop of a, a shared and serious and dangerous threat uh, of terrorism. Um, I mean, to follow up on, uh, on the ambassador's point about, uh, about uh, the Arab Spring more broadly, I mean, I think all of our governments uh, align themselves very quickly with the kind of revolutionaries, those who are uh, were trying to push away their autocratic regimes because, uh, because we believe that more pluralistic, democratic, uh, flexible governments in those countries uh, will provide for the aspirations of their people and, and that will start to ease uh, some of the pressures that have caused the extremism that we see. But as the ambassador said, you know, it creates a, a quite a significant short-term threat and we are now seeing parts of the Middle East uh, becoming, in, again, permissive environments for, uh, for AQ and other terrorist groups to operate in. And, and the challenge for us is to manage that short-term threat of how we get through the next few years uh, uh, safely um, if we are to, to reap the longer-term reward of a, a more stable, pluralistic uh, Arab world. Mm -hmm. Richard, I know you wanted to jump in as well. well. If I could, just about the um, uh, legal framework. I think having a proper internationally agreed <clears throat> legal framework to fight terrorism is enormously important. Of course, everyone would agree with that. Um, but I think there's, and we now have 16 international agreements in, on counterterrorism. But I think there are two main reasons why having a, an effective internationally agreed legal framework uh, is important. One is, as uh, the ambassador said, um, because we got to remember what we're fighting for as well as who we're fighting against. And that's very important to, to be sure of our values. But the other thing is to be successful in countering terrorism. We really have to have international consensus and international cooperation. And if, you, if we're doing it on a level playing field with everybody agreed as to what is terrorism or what isn't terrorism and what can be done and, and what should be protected and so on, we're much more likely to maintain, build and maintain a consensus. And you know, clearly America has been under attack and Western countries are under attack and being threatened. But in fact, since uh, 2001, the vast majority of victims of, of terrorism have been in Muslim-majority countries. And so it's the whole world which is really facing this threat. And it's therefore, I think, incumbent upon 
the United Nations or other international bodies to try and uh, find ways for the whole world to work together on agreed principles. Mm -hmm. Since everyone here on the panel is connected in some way, not only with international institutions, but also with Europe, I'm curious what, uh, what the response is to the question about Europe's homegrown threats as opposed to those that emanate from uh, Al-Qaeda elsewhere in the world. Have you seen an evolution uh, in the nature of that over the last decade? I mean, uh, Gilles, you talked a little bit about uh, the rise of the internet-enabled uh, lone wolf. Uh, does that change fundamentally what, what European counterterrorism policy is? Is there a more significant threat at home now than there was, say, a decade ago? Yes, uh, as I said, it's not a lot of uh, in number, yeah. but, but it's, it's a difficult uh, challenge. And, and as from 7-7, as I think it was mentioned yesterday, uh, we've started investing in, in uh, what you call CVE, what we call radicalization and recruitment. And, and as already was said, uh, we, it, it, a lot ha has to happen at local level. Uh, we think that we have to, uh, uh, the, 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 the best level where to tackle the problem is, is at the local level by mobilizing uh, the frontline uh, uh, um, people, be it teachers or uh, social workers, health workers, uh, prison or probation staff, or, uh, and, and we've started a, a process of uh, awareness raising because we want them to detect as, as early as possible any sign of radicalization and engage with them because they may tell us more uh, what is feeding this process of radicalization, so identify the grievances. Uh, so it's, it's something we have started building, a, a sort of network with practitioners uh, in Europe. But we, do the, we need to do that in, in, inside Europe. We, do, we need to do that more outside Europe, in third countries. And it's a huge challenge to, to do that. Uh, um, I fully agree with what Quinton uh, Dikorovich said uh, this morning, that we need to um, really better understand uh, the, the, how all this develop in, in third countries by having field studies where we tr really identify the triggers uh, and, and, and try to identify who can help in this. Because very often we engage with the wrong people. And so trying to, to do that more, we have started doing that uh, together, the EU and the US. Uh, we have had two quite interesting brainstorming on the diaspora, the Pakistani diaspora and the Somali diaspora. Because uh, as we said at the time, they are uh, uh, sometimes part of the problem, but mainly part of the solution. And, and we can build very interesting projects uh, with this. Mm, that's interesting. I, Ambassador yeah. Emin, I know you wanted to yeah. get in well, on Well, we it. studied this phenomenon in Germany. Where we all have about, uh, all European countries have about 10% of our population uh, as immigrant, uh, immigrants coming from, or were born out, outside of our nations. So um, we, we studied that and came to the conclusion that about, we have about roughly 300 suspects uh, in Germany. And 50 of them are apostates, people who, ha who are really ethnic Germans, born in Germany with German uh, backgrounds, who uh, changed their religion, became Muslim, uh, and, uh, and then uh, some of them moved to Afghanistan and, 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 and uh, Yemen, uh, Somalia to, to fight. So uh, we, we really uh, invested a lot of effort to uh, study the psychological uh, events that had taken place and really brought them where they went. And uh, first of all, we thought that maybe it's social deprivation. Maybe they are suffering from, uh, from social uh, hardships and, and they are poor and, and one could solve a problem with money. And uh, this obviously is not the case. Uh, this was the first we've learned. And uh, uh, the second uh, uh, observation was that we cannot reach these people with traditional means. So uh, the best uh, strategy we have developed in Germany now is that we use the, uh, the imams of the, uh, of the Muslim communities in Germany, that they approach these people. Because a German teacher, uh, somebody who would look like me, would not have uh, so much authority with, the, with these people. So it's people from their own background, uh, um, imams, talk to them, must talk to them and bring them back. And again, I think that one case which I think is a study which is, is fairly open, uh, the, the bomber, uh, uh, the Christmas bomber who f tried to uh, fly a pl plane into Detroit uh, uh, Christmas on, Christ on a Christmas day. I think this guy uh, ob obviously suffered from the effect that his father was a wealthy banker 
and the family was quite successful and he had the feeling that he would never achieve a similar uh, level in life uh, with, with his own possibilities. So he felt somehow depressed about it and in the end uh, he was looking for, uh, for a, a reason why he was insufficient in his, uh, in his life plans and uh, said, well, it, it, is the, it, is, it is the outside world that is really uh, 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 unjust uh, and, and the Ummah, the community of, of people like, like him, uh, has to be protected, and that's why he's, he was prepared to sacrifice himself. So these kind of psychological uh, uh, developments uh, which take place in the development of individual people really has to be, have to be studied if we want to address the issue. Mm -hmm. Karen, do you want to add anything in terms of the sort of question of homegrown terrorist threats? Yeah, I mean, you know, clearly it's been a problem in the UK, and, uh, and it's been a very difficult one uh, to tackle. Um, Somebody said yesterday that it was because the UK was unwelcoming. Um, the, the, the problems are a bit more subtle than that, and they are uh, around really our ability to properly integrate immigrant communi communities, and that there are a set of cultural issues there, and there are a set of economic issues. Um, I mean, the things that we have really learned, we were starting this work mostly after 9-11, but it accelerated significantly after 2005 and what we've really learned is that it has to be very local and very specific. Uh, we try in areas of vulnerability to, uh, to counter the ideology and, and what's being preached uh, either by imams or uh, all the stuff that people are picking up on the internet. Uh, we work with uh, groups or individuals who we identify as being vulnerable and we work with community leaders and, and other institutions. And, and I mean, I think it was said by Quentin on the earlier panel, uh, you know, we are also doing this in a very diverse way. So uh, there is no sort of one size fits all uh, approach to it. It depends on the community and the individuals that you're dealing with. But you're often dealing with, you know, the police, the social services, education authorities, all sorts of different parts uh, of the UK system uh, is now engaged in this in uh, certainly in a much more subtle way than it was uh, in 2001. I mean, one of the really critical things for us post-2005 was the, uh, the much clearer involvement of the, of the communities and the community leaders uh, that we got. I think before 2005, it was difficult for some of them to recognize that there was a problem with their, within their own communities. But I think uh, we've moved quite a long way on that uh, post-77. I, I do want to get to questions from the audience, but quickly, Richard, I want to go back to y your day job, as it were, uh, and the question of uh, Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. We've uh, heard a little bit on the previous panel, sort of mentions in a very vague way of uh, peace talks. I don't think anyone was taking that all too seriously, it, it seemed, in many ways. Uh, but I'm curious what your thoughts are about both uh, the prospects for how things will play out with Afghanistan over the next couple of years and whether uh, there is the prospect of that in some significant way changing uh, the external terrorism threat? Well, uh, indeed, I, I think Afghanistan has become more and more an Afghan issue rather than uh, any inspiration for global terrorism. Uh, the presence of Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, I think, now is pretty small. Uh, sure, Al-Qaeda is in the Afghan-Pakistan border area, and it would be desperately keen to be involved in uh, Afghanistan again, and of course will do whatever it can to prevent a, any political process taking off and maturing in Afghanistan, because it wouldn't be in the interest of, of Al-Qaeda to see stability in that area. But the actual opportunity to prevent that from happening, I think, is pretty limited at the moment. And I think the, the factors that can encourage Taliban into a political process or discourage them from joining. I think um, uh, Doug Lute was talking about uh, on the earlier panel. And one of the main problems of getting the Taliban engaged in the political process is really, well, what is the Taliban? And I think that you can sort of segment the Taliban into three parts. You know, every, everybody likes to divide things into three parts. Um, <laughs> and uh, if, if you can do that, with admitting that it's oversimplifying the matter, You've got one group of Taliban who are highly pragmatic. They want to get involved in Afghanistan, in the government of Afghanistan. They see the need to talk to other Afghans, talk to the United States, talking to other international partners and so on, and even to the uh, Karzai government. 
uh, in order to come to some sort of agreement. They're not interested in having Al-Qaeda hanging around their necks anymore, thank you very much, um, and they probably accept that there could be some American presence and so on uh, after uh, this sort of new government took, took shape. So that's one group, relatively easy to deal with. Then you've got a central group who are perhaps also uh, interested in negotiation, in discussion, but perhaps more in an attempt to play for time, to take the pressure off them from uh, military operations and so on, um, and also just to sort of feel their way a little bit, but perhaps still stick to some of those key issues of uh, needing the foreign forces to withdraw and all this sort of thing. But nonetheless, you know, a certain amount of pragmatism, but a certain amount of politics as well. And then on the other side, you've got a group who really are determined to fight to the finish, that they're not going to compromise on any of the issues that they've been fighting for over the last 10 years. You know, we stood by that. That's what got us kicked out of power. Why should we now change our position in order to be able to go and get a diluted power? And the problem with these three sections of Taliban is, is how to bring them together. How powerful is each one? And the only combining factor is really Mullah Omar. And it's not absolutely clear, I don't think, where Mullah Omar stands. And I think that is probably quite deliberate on his part because in order to be able to um, maintain his authority, he probably doesn't want to go any particular way. But having said that, and I don't want to go on too long because it's easy to go on too long. Um, <laughs> having said that, there is a great deal of effort, of course, by the, the Afghan government, by the High Peace Council, um, by the United States, by the international community, by the United Nations, insofar as we can help, to try and bring everybody together and accept that what has to happen now in Afghanistan has to be led by the Afghans. And if it's not satisfactory to the Afghans, then there is a danger, I'm afraid, if not going back into a civil war like it was you know, um, in the 90s, at least going back to a period of deep instability and warlordism and little pockets of, of people who are um, promoting narcotics trade and other money-making schemes and uh, spreading out instability to the region. But the bottom line is you don't see any real live prospect of serious talks anytime uh, this year. Well, it's not going to happen this week. No, I mean, <laughs> not this week. Uh, what well, about this year? We're already, <laughs> what, Friday, so it's a bit difficult. Okay, now I'd love to get some questions from the audience uh, before uh, we send you off to dinner. So we have microphones here, and do identify yourselves. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let me, uh, Tom Henke from Chicago. Hello, thank you to the panel, uh, and thank you for commuting all the distance that you did to join us today. Uh, let me see if I can get my European sports analogies correct here. Uh, which local club uh, among sort of regionalized terrorist organizations do you see as being a threat to step up to the Premier League, if you will? So if we look at some of these localized or regional threats, uh, Hezbollah being uh, a prime one, uh, Lashkari Taiba, uh, Boko Haram, which of those do you see perhaps threatening uh, North American or European interests in the near future? Thank you. I'll, I'll go first the... then. Okay. I mean, I was just going to say, I think we'd probably come back to the Arab Spring on that one. Um, you know, it, it, it occurs to us that uh, hopefully only a small number, but a small number of uh, British would-be jihadis are looking pretty closely at uh, a number of Middle Eastern countries at the moment, whether it's Libya or Syria or the Sinai, as places that they can go to and uh, train up in jihadi methods and get a bit of militant experience. And if they were to do that and if they were to return to the UK, uh, that would pose a significant threat to us. So, you know, there is the, the sort of uh, it's the chaos bit uh, in some of those countries that is particularly worrying. I mean, the other organisations that you mentioned... Uh, are also worrying. Uh, the other one I would mention is Iran, and you know we are seriously concerned about. You know, as Iran comes under more and more political and economic pressure as a result of their nuclear program, there is uh, an increasing risk that they will become uh, an even greater state sponsor of terrorism than they already are. You know, I, uh, as I understand it, my own government is still making an assessment on the Bulgaria attack, but Israeli. Uh, diplomats have already been attacked in India, Azerbaijan, and other places. And, you know, I think there's a pretty strong reason to believe that that, that will only increase uh, in the current mm -hmm. climate. Mm -hmm. I, I would be more worried by, by this phenomenon of Al-Qaeda, especially from Yemen, trying to call for individual jihad. 
and find Europeans uh, with a, a passport of a member state not known by the police trying to go abroad in a country where they can train and, and get expertise. Uh, it's less and less uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, more and more Somalia, more and more Yemen, and coming back and, and mounting attack. I think yesterday in Dusseldorf, one started a, 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 the trial of four uh, um, German, they were dual national, I think, and they went to Afghanistan, Pakistan, and, 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 and got training there and got direction. And, and I think that is the phenomenon, which is, in fact, the, the, the most difficult to tackle. And, and, and what we said uh, about uh, uh, lone wolf, but it's not a huge phenomenon for the time being, hopefully. Well, I, I would object to the football analogy because these people will not play to the rules, and uh, uh, so I think they will all, uh, all they are all dangerous. And what we see uh, is that a great number of states is close to become a failed state. Look at look at North Africa. You can draw a line from Mauritania and on, on the west. Uh, through Niger, Mali, uh, uh, well, uh, Egypt so far is, 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 is an exception, but the Sinai already is a dangerous place. You can go on uh, to, uh, to the east and, and you end up somewhere in, in, in Indonesia probably. So uh, the, the, the larger this part of the world gets that is unstable, and it unfortunately it looks as if this is a growing part of the world, the more uh, fertile ground is there for the, for these movements, and and again, uh, we, uh, we we I think it's not enough to look at them as, as just another adversary and another group which we can somehow fight with uh, with, with conventional means. We also have to win the uh, the intellectual debate. We have to make sure what is the West, and the West. Uh, I think it came to a clear de definition when America came under attack um, under September 11th. In an, Afghanistan is not a na NATO NATO area, but it was uh, America when it when it called in Article 5 of, of a NATO treaty. It was the Europeans that went with you to Afghanistan, an area where we felt no connection to. Uh, it was not the Asians, and now of course we were, uh, let me now. Speak a little bit the, the view. There's a debate here in America about the pivot to, 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 towards the Pacific, and I'm, I'm certainly not one who would object to uh, that we address China and, 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 and the countries in the Pacific, but we should do it together because uh, the, the, the Afghanistan uh, case uh, is proof that we belong together and we share something together that, that makes up our identity. Okay, I think we have time for one or two quick questions from this very excellent table. <laughs> uh, Mike Kelly from TASC. Um, we've heard uh, in the last day or two uh, the need for uh, the United States to understand a more risk-based approach to develop a sense of resiliency uh, to terrorism. Uh, you see the United States from a much different perspective and, of course, have been continually attacked uh, as Europe as a whole. Do you think America can really develop a sense of resiliency and can really, could really live with the frequency of attacks that occur in Europe? This is something we were talking about a little bit before. I think the, the British must answer that. Well, yes, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, this is the Mitt Romney question. <laughs> oh, we can come on to that. Um, uh, on, the, on the resilience issue, I mean, I, I take issue with the, the statement that about the number of attacks in Europe. There haven't been a huge number of attacks uh, in Europe since 9-11. There have been some, but, uh, you know, as I said at the beginning, our security services and others have worked very hard to ensure that hasn't been the case. Um, on the issue of resilience, uh, are Europeans more resilient than Americans? I don't know. I mean, I think, uh, certainly in Britain, I think that people have a different attitude towards risk. And my sense is that as far as terrorism is concerned in the US, you have a kind of zero tolerance attitude. Nothing must get through. I think in the UK, certainly, uh, people are a bit more realistic than that. And they understand that our police, security services, others, are working very hard to protect us, but it's not impossible in that, you know, even in those circumstances that something gets through. And it is just more our attitude. I mean, you know, we are also in the UK informed by our experience in Northern Ireland. And, you know, perhaps that has helped us develop a more resilient uh, approach. I mean, I do think it's really important because I think if attacks happen and it closes down everywhere, then 
the terrorists have won. You know, that's what they're trying to do. Even with a small attack, they want to provoke a big response. And the more we can take a deep breath and get on with our lives, the better. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a really important point. And I, I think that the, you know, even a non-attack causes a tremendous impact, doesn't it? It's like um, Abu, Fru, Abu Mutala, as was mentioned earlier. And, um, you know, it's, I think unless we internationally all have a greater resilience to terrorism, we're never going to get rid of it or, or get it down to a more manageable level because there will always be this sort of asymmetric uh, reaction that will make terrorism enormously uh, popular as a political tool. And the United States is extremely good, I think, in building infrastructural resilience. There's been an awful lot of effort about that. But on the social resilience and the political resilience, too, if I may say, I think you know, it, it is different here from many other countries in the world. And I'm not quite sure why that should be, because, of course, there's a, an understanding in the United States that all sorts of other terrible crime can happen and will happen, you know, like, like we saw just down the road in Aurora the other day. Um, and there's good resilience about that. You know, the country comes together and it, and it reacts well in a, in a positive way. Um, but somehow with, with terrorism, there's a sort of assumption that you can, you can have zero risk, which, of course, is impossible. No one would, would say it was possible. And so it doesn't, it doesn't make terrorism a yawn sort of thing, you know, oh, my God, just some other loser in... Baghdad saying he's going to attack us in our very heart, you know, for Christ's sake, get a life type of thing. You know, it's, it's you know, we, we don't have enough of that, I think, in, in this country. It's, it's a, a question of political leadership. I heard today that it was impossible for the president, especially on an electoral year, to, to start having a, another discourse. But I think we said Janet Napolitano and, and others should, should maybe make the point that 100% at, at security is not achievable. Um, and maybe the context uh, that was mentioned today that we should revisit the AUMF, uh, look at, at uh, a different response to a different threat, and maybe evaluate from time to time if the resources are still uh, necessary and which would not streamline or downsize a bit, maybe it would be a context to, to maybe give up this 100% approach like the 100% scanning and screening of cargo, which is a nonsense, and look for a risk-based approach, as, as you said, I think it would be a good context to, to have that debate. But that should happen in, in, in Congress. Okay, so we have time for one last very brief question and very brief answers. Thank you, Jim Jeffrey. Uh, I'm troubled by the last comment, and uh, uh, to avoid making a rebuttal, but rather putting a question out, because that's what I'm supposed to do very quickly, <laughs> Uh, what would you think of the argument that America is a little different than Europe in that almost all of the West's kinetic actions in the world for the last 25 years or so have been led and by and large conducted by American power despite a lot of help in Afghanistan in particular and that much of the terrorist attacks, certainly the explicit arguments made by al-Qaeda on 9-11, was to get America to stop doing these, what I called earlier to the day, uh, wars of choice. And therefore, we're, we have a different dynamic in our own country about uh, the, the cost of terrorism because these people are trying to get us to pursue a specifically different policy. So that's my question. What do you think of that? <laughs> <laughs> I think the German ambassador uh, has a response to his ambassadorial colleague. I think, <laughs> well, uh, um, I believe we should listen to their propaganda. We should know what they are asking for. And of course, Al Qaeda came up and said, uh, we, our objective is to get the American troops out of Saudi Arabia. The holy sites are. Uh, uh, are there, so we, we cannot allow foreign troops there. That, what, that came up after, after the Gulf War. But I, th but I think it, it is not a, this is not all that is behind Al-Qaeda or behind the terrorism. So there, there is more. There is a deep uh, philosoph philosophical divide. Uh, uh, civil liberties, human rights, market economy, on, uh, women rights on the one side, and on the other side, a, uh, the idea of a, uh, of a state where religion uh, or God is 
the ultimate source of power and, and decision making. Um, so this is very fundamental. And um, the, the, I, I cannot see a compromise between the two. And uh, on the list of the grievances are, of course, American wars. Maybe they, they help produce probably on some occasions people who are affected by, 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 by your bombs or by our bombs. And, uh, then they, it's easier to recruit them. But I think in the, in the core is something more deep. Well, can I just comment as well? I, I, I mean, America has, has given a fantastic lead on counterterrorism, both you know, in, in direct action and uh, politically as well. And, and no one denies that. And it's, you know, uh, certainly, I see it in the UN, whether in Security Council or General Assembly, there's been a huge uh, effort of leadership by the United States. Um, but I think that you know, just as all politics is local, so is terrorism very local. And if you look at the individuals who are now uh, getting active again in Indonesia, for example, I don't think they're, or the Philippines, I don't think they're really thinking about the United States and what the United States has been doing. Similarly in Somalia and Kenya and Boko Haram and, you know, all these sort of groups, I think, are essentially incredibly local. Now, the rest of the world is certainly going to look for United States assistance in dealing with those issues, or individual member states are going to look to the United States for help in dealing with those issues. But I think that, you know, I very much uh, agree with what Peter was saying, that um, the, the things that terrorists, that really make somebody radical to the point of wanting to be violent uh, are not things about America so much as things about, I don't know, what his mother-in-law said or something. You know, I mean, I think they're really, really very, very personal. And Al-Qaeda manages to exploit those emotional um, responses by saying, well, it's all because of America. Or it's all because of the Western world or something like that. I mean, I'm not sure it's a, really a, a distinction that's helpful to make. I can, see, uh, I can see if you're sitting in the US how it feels like uh, you, know, you are leading us uh, in the was in Iraq and Afghanistan, and, and we are incredibly grateful for that leadership, and you know, our, Europe's collective security has benefited from it. But uh, sitting in Europe, it feels like we are all engaged in the same endeavor, and those people are coming against all of us. Um, and so I'm not, sure that, uh, you know, I'm not sure that it's possible to say that, uh, you know, that uh, the terrorists are coming after America because they're American, um, American wars. I don't think they are. I think they belong to all of us. Thank you very much. I think that's a, a good note to end on. And I want to thank uh, the audience as well as this terrific panel. Thank you.